Okay, hello everyone, welcome to tonight's episode. When the greater vision of the species activates, and so what could the roar of eons be? What could that idea suggest? I would like to specifically anybody who is listening to just prepare a piece of paper or notebook around you. Have a notebook and a piece of paper around you, not per se for what I would say, for something that your mind notices while I give this talk. Especially if there are people who their states of mind are uh, flexible. So when the greater vision of the species activates, <laughs> it's a suggestion that an event will take place, take place for human beings where in every person's value system there will be a common denominator. There will be one important value which everyone will have. I want you to envision a character who is a master swordsman. This master swordsman has put away the sword, has put away the fighting, <clears throat> you know, because of the cruelty. Now, this swordsman has gone into a village and is in the village. Now the village is under attack. This whole life this warrior has built, hidden, hiding his true power, his true potential, and suddenly, in that moment where the village is under siege, he picks up the sword, this time a force he had misused, now he is properly using. Because honestly, it doesn't matter what is in your hand, it doesn't matter if it's a sword, it doesn't matter if it's a stick, whatever it is, it's your intention. It's how your attention moves to the destination already. You know, there's something about how we approach things, how we want to look towards things that suggest the outcome. So this swordsman who has renounced fighting, suddenly in that moment he's pushed to the brink. He has held his power, he has held his uh, ability back, 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 back until there is nowhere else to hold it, until the moment is being pushed. Then this master swordsman realizes it is time to educate an army and he marches in. Do you know? <clears throat> and the whole point of this, the reason I shared that story, that's a common theme in a lot of fighting shows, you know? <laughs> but the whole point of it was that something was kept dormant and then it was activated. Now I want you to imagine that the human species has a potential. There's a potential you have, but then there's a potential your species has. Oh my God, what is that potential? You know? <laughs>
So first thing is to suggest that there is a greater vision. Many people feel there is no, uh, there is not that much organization to human living, you know. That means if you see it as a battlefield, you want a certain winner. I think about our species a lot more than <clears throat> I feel uh, I should, more than it's, it's kind of normal. But the reason I think about it so much is because everything that is normal that we are doing is leading to the future. That means when I ask what is the moment, what is the value of the moment, or to whom does it have a moment, it has an immediately moment, a value to you and to the future generations. Our ancestors are all dead, you know? You know, I think about if I, if anybody ever has a potential to live for themselves. I think about that question to such a degree, I don't know, like when you, when you live for yourself, it is momentary. Technically, we are born to live for the future. And when the future is taken away and the past is past, literally the present moment can become hell. What does that mean? That means 8 billion creatures on a rock in the middle of nowhere. If they can't align, if they cannot generate vision and move in accordance to it, there's literally nothing to do. Do you know, have you seen how <clears throat> when a person is alone, they suggest that it's, it's a sort of intensity. Do you know, like during this whole coronavirus situation, I remember seeing a parody video of this person acting like everything's fine, but the person's going insane in their house or something, you know? <clears throat> now, I want you to consider this in a sense of a cosmic level. On a cosmic level, we're creatures on a, on a rock in the middle of nowhere making noise. That's, that's really it, as when, when you want to say visually or auditory-wise, that's like... Pretty much, I, don't, I can't tell if I am being my senses or the senses are being me. I can't tell if the eye is separate to the senses or the senses are, are <clears throat> and the eye are the same. You know, do you see how cool that is? Uh, it's, no, I mean, I'm, I'm, not <laughs> I'm just trying to share it just for the architecture of the sentence sometimes. So we can say that 8 billion creatures on a rock in the middle of nowhere in an empty uh, cosmos, let us say, we have nothing to do other than play a game. And what we see going on in regards to individualism, identity, how people are today,
the games either need to change or the players do. If the players can change the game, they must change themselves. If the game can be changed, the players will automatically change. You know, you see, for example, in a soccer pitch, you know, the referee blows the whistle and, and the player has to stop and has to take it, the karma of the moment, you know. I feel that's what civilization needs to be in regards to, and it may sound a bit unrealistic now, but I feel in the future with the developments of AI after 2050, we're probably going to get there. Sorry, guys. Got interrupted for a second. Um, I don't know what to say, really. When I think about just the analogy that we're on emptiness and a game has started and this game is temporary and the whole time the player is wondering how to play the game and we're even wondering what the field is like completely. You know, we're like players playing a game where we cannot see the field completely. We can't see the referee. We can't see the goalposts. And we, have, we can only see the soccer ball, which is our most immediate experience of a conscious mind. I honestly feel just like how people accept an alphabet. I feel people accept an alphabet of accept of uh, valid expression. So many things the human being considers, but very few of them the human being vocalizes. I can tell you a lot of life actually hasn't been happening in life. It is kind of impossible to localize it. Let me tell you why. <clears throat> Somebody comes and, let's say, I don't know. Some nights when I come to speak, it is, sometimes there's an emotion there, there isn't a thought. And as I stay in the emotion and I look at what kind of thought it could be, then a thought appears usually. I can say it's all about seeing a film fast forward in your head. A four billion year old film fast forwarding to now 
and us realizing this is just a fragment of a snapshot of a changing world. What it, what it really means is that everybody should feel free. You know, existence should feel free. But it doesn't. And that's the question, why would existence doubt itself? How can intelligence wonder about itself? You know, I mean, when you look at life, you're like, sure, you know, things can uh, linearly make sense. Step A, step B, step C. But then it's like, why are the steps even there? Why is step A even there? You know, guys, I feel reading for you an essay. Perhaps the essay's voice could be slightly quicker than mine. This uh, essay is called Live in a Reality of Allowance. I wrote it 2015 from the source of language. Live until you are the beyond. Spend enough time with yourself until the truth of all nature is found here and now. Who are you being right now? Ask this until all have become just like now. Our civilization is just a single bit of brick for the greater civilizations to come. You are more than an accumulation of memory. Do not doubt the divinity of the moment that comes and goes on its own. Confront also the true nature of all phenomena in this universal sector. You have spontaneously sprouted into manifest form within. What is more beautiful? A field of flowers or the self-awareness of the field of activity of the knower within that can never be warded. A purposeless purpose is grand in a world of cyclical ignorance. Nature is not wrong. It is just that if the moment was called destiny, it would know better. You are the source of language. No mask can hide your undoable, unified nature. Wash your face in a morning that has always been now. You're a moment of being. Never forget it. Have you noticed you live each day once because we're looking at time and space through a segmented categorical evaluation? We have to wonder how and what is the philosophy of language not revealing about the direct experience that mystics, yogis, Zen masters 
Buddhas and, you know, just that inspiration is revealed. Do you see? We must realize. <clears throat> are we treasure revealers of a material mountain-like world? Or are we treasure revealers of the essence and the origin of the spark of our consciousness? That the moment we open our eyes in the morning, we have opened all existence into being. It's no little thing being alive. So it's as if each day lives and dies. The moment you open your eyes, it's as if a being has come into the world. And the moment you close it, it's as if this being has gone. Do you see? And so it seems rather than us just living one life, each time we blink, we're living a new universe of thought. So we can say that the ability of the imagination is a multiversal, natural, intuitive presence that once you realize the nature of your reality and you are sincere and have, you know, <laughs> selfless devotional service to the absolute and the core of what you are, the world will open up, not just the waves of seas and prophecies. Every moment is a reunion with the love of the cosmos that has manifested into an intelligence that can look in the mirror and be like, yo, I'm not a person alone in this world. I am a universe happening. That experiential vastness is beyond the poet's pen. Who we are is a transcendental absolute intelligence of an emptiness that was already being what it was. Life is easy if you don't make it hard. Guys, this next essay, <laughs> it has a good title. I'm going to read it and I'll get back to the talk. Remember, a magnifying glass can be put on anything. <laughs> <clears throat> the guy without a watch. It is okay to be the guy without a watch. Time should not be bondage, but a catalyst of great inspiration for self-realization. What if life was a comedian and you are the joke? Could there be more to the act on the stage made with ether, emptiness, and the four elements, earth, air, fire, water? By sincerely and truly acknowledging the accurate qualities and abstract dynamics these four words point to, the source is mirrored in how the movement of thought is a play of these elements simultaneously. Ether holds all elements. The idea follows that even thoughts are expressions of nature, and so in any enlightenment business, the true nature of the moment of our world must not be forgotten. To deepen this, when we look at the grandeur of how language, in quotation, moving noise, oscillations, has come into manifest form, we are left in the spontaneous awe of, of how all that you have ever known has been here, and now, always, in all ways. Existence is not going anywhere. It is just non-existence that is doubting itself. The movement of the pen is also the movement of the mind. Did you know Mother Teresa was a cosmic star lord, commander of the peace of a world that is not, in quotations, just filled with light, but is it? The finale is now. Who are you, my dear reader? The watch is heavy, but the source of all intelligence is light. <clears throat> And uh, this next one is definitely something I, I think <laughs> many people feel like telling me. <laughs> the ego speaks too much. This is the 12th essay. 
from the source of language a book I wrote years ago. When sincerity and peacefulness of the mind are found to become one, the true devotee of life's endless direction becomes the god of one's own imagination just to see the void, smiling beyond veils. As thought rebels against the thinker, inefficiency will ensue that will just slightly influence you from the truth path of self-realization you already know. The garden of paradise is filled with many beautiful flowers. The, intellig the intelligence of vision blooms everywhere. The presence of life is tolerant and whole. To be direct and complete, you must, as an, in quotations I thought, observe yourself into your natural divine self and overall presence. On such a mountain peak, your true nature shall gift you with the remembrance of how you have always been your own blessing. Study the mind until God remembers God before God needed to be God. Of course, these are just words and I'm allowing expression to happen as if nature was something to never ignore or move away from. Some have said four billion years of evolution has not been enough for the ape's advanced step. Others were never interested in the monkey business going the wrong direction. As it, as it is observed, we cannot choose to see the world within a frame of design or not. Some artworks are chaotic, but the imagery of accepted reality in your mind is like the edge of your ego that, like an iceberg, reveals only a little bit of what it is. If reality <clears throat> was multidimensionally void in the beauty of cosmic intelligence, the source of language has already responded to how the expression is to be received. A drop does not have any questions for the ocean that it is being. Do not focus your attention on what does not serve you. Prioritize, prioritize self-realization like a father that is reuniting with his son, S-U-N. The body of the soul, ego, and the mind's void space cannot withstand the grand majesty of self-realization stream that once you are in tune with existence, non-existence could never touch the eternal moment that is beyond the expression of a cause and effect story-like experience. There is no need to fight blindness with blindness. Shine like how the solar system has made you and kept you in your eyes. We are in an era where self-realization matters and shall become the great tidal wave and catalyst for a new for new multidimensional renaissances inspired by the now, capital N, to occur. Just like many applications, the application requires to be updated. Shall a loud mouth turn into the silence of consciousness? As Mr. Within has said, we are in many rooms at the same time. What that means is that the planet remembers every memory, every civilization that has spun around itself in the emptiness of space. Reverse engineer all illusions into a moment of truth, either the explorer's clarity or the explorer's confusion. <clears throat> either the explorer's clarity or the explorer's confusion. Don't fuse with the reality that is a fusion of cons. Honor your divine moment and let the life reveal itself to you, for greatness cannot wait to meet itself beyond ideas. The hammer is heavy and it must be carried for a long time, but it is only needed for an instant of time. Break the hourglass of ignorance. Language should be utilized with the silence of divinity. Already acknowledged as origin's origin. The sun does not burn you, the ego does. This unknown accumulation that is used imposing a static idea, even though it is in a dynamic state. What is greater than words remains so. What is greater than worlds was beyond a clean mirror. It is as if you have become the, uh, so in tune with nature that your intuition always has known how to uh, be, for the intelligence is naturally being itself. Behind your eyes, you are God's essence. In front of your eyes, you are the creation of the world. There are many pieces to the ultimate peace. Nature has always smiled through your eyes beyond the demise of a world of, helpful, of hopeful interpretation. <clears throat> Activate your mind by revealing it as your greatest teacher. Who would have thought in this modern age they are their own greatest teacher? An advice to all writers, in quotations I've written this, write the book that you want to read. 
So the best book you can read is the one you write. Great vision is self-taught. Intuition is a natural access beyond the door of thought. When you write the book you have awaited a long time to read, when you have awaited to see the face of your mind across the printed page, life will happen as it always has. Such work reveals to the world how the nature of your mind is working. There is no block. No structured linguistic barrier of words defining realities, activities, and permission. The design of language must not be used ignorantly. What is the root cause of speech for a person who writes something and wants to also share something? The experiences of the current moment must be communicated factually onto the page smoother than the reflection in the mirror of change. Reality requires self-awareness and sincere selfless action. Like how social media must be used like watering a plant, like watering a plant, and you must focus on the destiny of truth that this moment is now and has always been the now. What secret do you feel that has not been shown? Oh my God, how long is this? Oh, okay, okay, it's a little long, guys. Okay, bear with me. <laughs> At least you don't have to read it, guys. <laughs> Okay, all right. <clears throat> what secret do you feel that has not been shared to you that this moment of existence and being has not already revealed to you as your moment? Beyond the heavy knees of writing a lowercase t, nature is its own divinity. Perhaps glory is selfless collective beauty and self-realization. Even self-remembrance is a great word to use here. Ask yourself and God shall answer as you. Language could never be like the prophet within your eyes that already knows everything. Just like how the emptiness of the cup once the tap is open has the potential to be full beyond the requirement for measurement. A person who writes something wants to share something. As you share your experience of life and the more truthful and sincere the work is, the more people understand how the book reflects your mind. The mind is an unknown origin of the body's language. A book is a communication to the world around you. What do you have to say? You should confront and communicate. A meditation shall naturally bloom in your moment, whereas focus enhances on the root cause of all problems. The center of the sky never went anywhere. Study the design of your experiencer, then transcend it. Who feels out it? Who can't accept? Who's inability? Are you separate from life or a part of it? Do you find the intelligence that you are separate from all that is being at once? As if you don't realize you're being part of the universe right now. Human beings are natural expressions of this universal sector. By nature, we are cosmic. True yoga is not about the poses. It, it is about the selfless devotional service to the absolute intelligence that you are and your moment is being. It's about being in tune with your moment and... Uh, it's about being in tune with your moment and it all happens. The surfboard <clears throat> on the way wave of chaos and order is empty, beyond feet. Why do you think this, they speak about Bhakti Yoga? The yoga of devotion is the reunion of all worlds into the ultimate. Because those who have truly confronted this life as it is are not concerned about the ideas of this world. They, they realize experience is something for an idea to navigate, but beyond ideas, there is greater expression. An innate presence beyond the personality's design keeps and is the same primordial wisdom that holds the seer endlessly alive in the eyes of man and every living being within this living universe. A great unified intelligence that is highly unspeakable, but a remembrance that can never be forgotten. You are looking for the self is in caps. You're looking for self-realization. That means to study the self that you are, and that means listening to your moment of life as it is happening. Self, real, pretty much realization. I've written the word here, but I've put the I in the middle of the word with two quotations to its side. <clears throat> so self-realization for the writer can mean for one to let the book intuitively happen like the miraculous genius in the seeds design and within our open eyes it is like once you have enough attention and focus the nature of thought reveals itself don't chase the divine butterfly let it land on your forehead forehead nature doesn't run late time is a teacher too space is a student of the classroom of mankind's imagination beyond lines of dualistic references you are your own righteousness and patience 
and patience is required until the ripples on the pond have settled themselves. Clarity is origin. Find the witness within. For as you are being within all that is present in this cosmos, you realize regardless of how raw intelligence was designed in the furnaces of manifestation's origin, what is within you is an omnipresent moment of being. We're living in a divine universe that transcends multiversal and multidimensional ambitions. Access is granted to the willing. Sincerity is the greatest preparation. The wisdom of your heart, your greatest guide. Consciousness is being all that is simultaneously within the moment. How heavy is the light of a changing universe? Once you see the life around you, the whole moment is being all of it, and part of it through a simultaneous elegance and cosmic fortitude. It is so easy. Your book will naturally be written, because you have realized what is within you is within all that is in the moment. Beyond the ignorance of education, education systems of this world that indoctrinate too much language and its emphasis, the barks of dogma for many can be heard from childhood on. A true free thinker is free beyond thought. Before any voice, the silence is its own, is, is its own only command. We are the stars of God. Nothing can be hidden. There are patterns here beyond the movement of abstract deities. Remind yourself beyond the experience of the, edge of, the, of the edge of worlds. The song of the sage is heard here and now. Be playful with language until self-realization is allowed. Okay, guys, that's, so I just read three essays randomly. <laughs> but there was, I think it's, um, uh, the idea is kind of, the ball got rolling. So give me a second, let me get paper here, hold on. Okay, guys, let's say, uh, let's create a spectrum, a hierarchy for a civilization and an advanced civilization. What are the phases that a civilization needs to go uh, to become an advanced civilization? Now, there's different methods. Some people, the way they think is they go see the edge of the system first. Pretty much every moment learning is like a circle. It's honestly like a circle. The origin of the concept has a central point. Then there is endless angles of how the concept has stretched forth. So I would say that, let us say, <laughs> let us say that I say that you <laughs> Okay, <laughs> self in a world. We have individuals and we have planet, pretty much two factors that make a civilization. People in a world, you know, that's it. <laughs> so the self, um, we're, we're, let's say we, uh, we create a chart here. We say 
So civilization is a relationship of self and world, or let's say outer realm and inner realm. I mean, civilization is in the outer realm, so I would, I would, okay, let's say self and world, okay? That's the pretty basic primary idea where selves in a world. <laughs> now, let's say right now uh, the world began from an inefficient world. What does that mean? That means there was an inefficient world. There was an inefficient self. Technically, there wasn't a, a, a world. I can't, I mean, here's the say. Um, let's say it's about a self and how it's treating its world. Okay? I could be confusing the audience here. Think of self, so, uh, a sense of self, a character on a sphere. <clears throat> now... The character can be inefficient, the civilization can be inefficient, the civilization is pretty much the setting of the character. So the setting is inefficient, the character is inefficient, now we have reached a point where the, the setting is still inefficient, the self is becoming efficient. People are so focused that self-help industry is, what is it, like a billion dollar industry or something, you know? So, from inefficient self, inefficient civilization to efficient self, inefficient civilization where, where we are now, now what, uh, <clears throat> uh, So how would this, yeah, there we go, perfect. <clears throat> so this is the chart, guys. Um, uh, uh, so um, this is Mr. Within's, let's call it Mr. <laughs> let's call it Mr. Within's um, chart of civilizations, okay? So uh, uh, the most, um, let's say, weakest form of civilization, let's say we were comparing our civilization to other planets, okay? Let us say that there is... Uh, uh, let us say all the planets in our solar system had civilizations built on it and unique animals on each planet had become conscious. So, what would that mean if we were to compare our civilization? how much the senses of self are aware, how much the self is aware of itself, how much the civilization is aware of itself, right? So, so the, uh, a, a, the first, oh my God, how do I say this? <laughs> okay, phase one, everything's inefficient. People are being inefficient, the system's inefficient. We are there now, let's say. Let's just, let's just say. Then we have to go where the sense of self becomes, either the sense of self becomes efficient or the world becomes efficient. If it's too hard to change every person on the planet, well, guess what? We've got to change the system, the overall system, yeah? So I would say inefficiency, in, uh, yeah, let's say phase one of a civilization, things are inefficient. The second phase it goes through, the self is efficient, the world is inefficient, then based on which it feels, like if our if the world evolved, no, I mean we evolved quicker, so we became efficient than the civilization. So I, I, E, I, I, E, E, E. So the next phase is, in order to uh, advance to an efficient civilization, we have to handle the inefficient individual. We have to... The individual has to become efficient somehow. And if the individuals are efficient, then the civilization can become efficient.
And an advanced civilization is where there is an efficient uh, awareness of self and there's an efficient awareness of the civilization to itself. Right now, the civilization is taking more than it's giving. I sometimes wonder about in the future if after the year 2050 or something, as Ray Kurzweil suggests, <clears throat> imagine there is no uh, an AI computer can make better decisions for a nation than a human president. Imagine computers can make way more excellent decisions and come up with excellent solutions to human uh, problems compared to human beings. Then the, the presidents of nations, if there is a greater system managing things, will become like the queen. They will become a symbol. They will become the human symbol. I mean, think about it. If there were extraterrestrials making contact and they were like choose a leader human beings you know or choose like they, they, the, the people's different nations would then require the president you know it's strange it's like all our ancestors were using what they know to continue their their unknown you know line of grandchildren, like what their grandchildren will do and whatever. So if we say there is a sort of cycle of behavior, pretty much what I'm saying is individuals maybe for themselves have seen the greater potential of the individual but imagine if every individual person right now was efficient. Nobody had a problem managing their life. Any, any problem. Do you know? Then the only thing left would be the collective system. That means if they, and do you, how do we know this? Because look at how many billionaires become philanthropists. What does that mean? What does that mean? <laughs> Pretty much something is building as a potential and it's going to activate. You can say language was an activation. When we were capable of communication, we started communicating. So imagine when we are capable of building an advanced civilization, we will build it. So all of this is to just plant the seeds so the future generations, you know. <laughs> no, it's like, it's like what was written on the person's gravestone. Don't mess it up, kids. <laughs> it's like, don't mess it up. That's it. Imagine that's the only sentence, you know, that is crucial to be remembered, you know. If we treat the system empty, we break it without consequence. We treat the system too full ideologically in a certain way, we, don't, we can't even let it change, you know. What does your species deserve? You know, everybody should wonder about this question and write a book on it.
you know, it feels like we're living in a picture that is up to each person's attention to change. And now to study the nature of attention in a collective way is more where we're headed, you know. <clears throat> we have individual philosophies, you know. And we have philosophies that by the nature of them being collective cannot categorize. It's as if when I look at my existence, there is nothing in existence separate. Everybody is existing. But when you use, when you experientially look at the existence, you see different textures and different dimensions and whatnot. You can say in order to have a greater vision, you need to be a greater self. So in order for the greater vision of the species to activate, there needs to be a greater self-analysis. You know, having mind is like experiencing your eyes as a wind, but as a wind that is moving a body. And if there is a potential reality beyond sensory perception. It means intelligence can't have an identifiable body. If all our identity and language is based on the visible, on what we've seen. Honestly, there's nothing other than an advanced civilization to build on on this planet. That's the greatest thing. The greatest invention is not man-made. The greatest invention is mankind-made. New systems of identity. Pretty much we should look at how we're being a player and how we are interpreting the game and endlessly update the player or change the structure of the game. You know, that means as a person, that's all you need to actually know to survive, just to know that it's a game and you got to continue. So guys, Jamie in the chat section says, is the nature of attention nature? 
the nature of attention is not something that that is shape it's what's being there before you are the idea of you it's it's sight do you know like if sight is your sight an object you see an object but is sight an object the act the event of sight you know, it's like many people go sightseeing, they don't realize they are a sight that is seeing. <laughs> it's like the person went sightseeing and discovered the nature of the attribute the seer within, that it could only be instant, and if it was worded, the duel, the duel has owned it already. There's this Zen story, this man, this sage sits, goes into this grassland, you know, this man, just, you know, not even a sage, let's say this random guy just goes into this grassland he sits down he closes his eyes for a moment then opens them and for a second wonders if this was the first day of his life what would life be and suddenly he gets this new view on everything that is there <clears throat> in this moment and he gets an insight a very deep insight as if a level of the mind unlocked changing the context shifted so dramatically that the uh, concept couldn't remain the same the world changed, the inner realm changes so much that the outer realm self was just navigating differently, functioning differently. So this man gets this insight and in the Zen story, there is a dark minion <clears throat> in another dimension. This dark minion looks at this guy getting, in, uh, getting realized, like no, learning more about the nature of reality, the true nature of reality. And he's like, oh my God, this guy's learning the truth. The dark minion runs to the dark lord. It's like, dark lord. Dark lord's like, what? You know, and the, <laughs> and the minion is like, yo, this guy just understood more about the truth. What do we do? This human being just saw through the simulation of language, you know? Oh, sorry, sorry. Not the simulation of language, but, um, or let's say, yeah. You know, that works. <laughs> the minion, dark minion says, this dude just saw more about the true nature of things. What do we do? And the dark min dark lord looks at the dark minion and says, don't worry. And the dark minion's like, why? He's like, because it's a human being. The human being is going to make a belief out of it. Any experience the human being perceives that is beyond, they constantly make it into an image. Do you see what I'm saying? <clears throat> it's the untouchable being. You can't touch it. That's why you can't. Like, you know, the way I'm explaining it is by uh, 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 authorizing myself to kind of poetically fly around it. Technically, in these talks, I'm getting close to touching something beyond the language threshold, then I have to pilot away when it becomes really non-dual. One of the most important teachings on this planet is that when you can, you require to be the life of the moment. The life of the moment has nothing to do with attention. It just means, <clears throat> it, I mean, it has to do with attention, but it means the life, to be the life of the moment means that if, let's say there's four beings, a person A, person B, person C, person D, sitting in a room, and they're all sitting silent. Let's say person C gets up and starts speaking. Do you know person C is giving a context to the moment? Do you know? This is why if people just focus on the concept, it doesn't make sense. But if you see reality in a dimension of a character in a world and people are, a are their own characters in their own worlds, technically our, the thought of ourself is like our inner realm is like the load. You know how? Some video games, you could choose the character, how the character looks like. It's like we're choosing what our identity is. Do you know what I mean? <laughs> we're inner characterizing the outer realm. So we can say the roar of eons is a certain moment where 8 billion drops who have been living with each other for a long time suddenly become a river. And the only thing the river has to do is to join the cosmic ocean. 
We start as an individual creature on Earth, a drop. We <clears throat> built an advanced civilization. We became a river. Then we became interstellar. We, uh, we, we accessed the ocean. The river went into the ocean. I remember there was this uh, person I saw, uh, <clears throat> I'm not going to name the person, but this person I saw who was this very great person, very able person, and somebody insulted them, and the person who insulted them was so, was so uh, lesser in comparison, and what the greater person did was instead of getting angry, he just laughed, but it wasn't a laugh of like anger or taunting it was just a laugh like <laughs> like you know a person trying to push a building kind of thing you know <laughs> honestly what it feels like is like the mind is this endless river of thoughts and when what i'm doing in these talks is literally getting a cup and like scooping water out of this river and throwing it into the pocket. <laughs> I mean, how many people really on this planet think about <clears throat> the greater vision of the whole thing? I think the whole thing, people are like, who's got the time for that? And that's where chaos wins. That's how chaos wins when we don't have the, the time to actually build our own advanced civilization. I feel the biology is being treated like a machine. The way the system, the economical sector is set up. People are literally in, uh, gears, you know? And it's kind of strange, you know? It's like somebody said, if you don't fall, if you don't, uh, um, uh, build your dreams, someone will hire you to build theirs. And that, what does that mean? That means it's like people have the option of consciously uh, uh, seeing meaning in phenomena. But if the person doesn't consciously see a meaning to their conscious life, Then it's as if, who was this world built for? You know, if we don't feel free on our own planet, it's like, you know how awkward that, that would be? You know, if we went to another planet and we're like, we don't even feel at home here. <laughs> An incredibly advanced civilization, just to give a glimpse of how it would be, we would probably have energy spheres around us. And we would be hovering throughout the day. Everybody would move, be moving through spheres, energetic spheres. It's honestly truth. I mean, if the person, here's the thing, if it's not to be or not to be, it's to move or to be moved. That means, let's say you're a person, <laughs> imagine you're a person sitting in a cinema, okay? And you just decide not to be moved by anything in your world and to be like, you know, ultimate power in, in, a, per, in a specific position. You know, imagine somebody who chooses to be... <laughs> Let's say the, uh, the dictator, uh, uh, the ego of a dictator, okay, it chooses to have an ego uh, of a dictator and the person sitting and the person at the end of, it's the end of the night, they're closing the cinema theater and the, uh, the security is like, sir, can you get out of here? What are you doing here? You know, it's like the films ended four hours ago and we're closing up and the person's like, no, I deserve to sit where I'm sitting. <laughs> So 
some moments you just have to continue the journey. There is no, not too much analysis of it even, you know? That means nobody is winning 24-7 because if they did, they would have no reason to do anything, you know? There is no completion when everything is changing. There is just improvement, strangely. <laughs> That's it. Human beings are here to experience conscious updates of the world. That's pretty much... <laughs> Um, the existential game we're in, you know. And I find it so crucial because I feel <clears throat> too much metaphysics, um, just focusing on the poetry can make the person not perceive that the question is way deeper, way, way deeper than just the storyteller becoming satisfied with some story. Whoever you are, wherever you are, <clears throat> you are alive. Eight billion points of intelligent potential have gathered around in this place called Earth. Different stories, different faces, different visions, different dreams. It's like we are in a dream where people are endlessly dreaming for more in this dream. And so it only works, I find, that if you start dreaming for an awakening. That is the, um, the gap in the clouds that is revealing the clear sky. That the person says, I am alive once, oh my God. Suddenly, the, let me tell you what I felt, uh, my own mortality, how it felt like. It, how it felt like when I really considered it, considered it and it just changed my whole attitude. What it was, was that imagine you are in this giant battlefield, giant battlefield, you can't see the edges of it, and just people are fighting. And imagine you just know that you have to walk to the end of this battlefield, <clears throat> and you know that whatever you do, or, uh, you will inevitably walk to the end of this battlefield. What happens is, for in, in my inner realms, my mortality, the fact I saw, I visualized my own gravestone. And there was an element of chaos there. The unavoidable chaos at the end of this lovely order. It was a shout. Imagine, like, imagine there is this just you're in again that battlefield land vision that you're in this endless battlefield and now imagine there is there is something at the far end of the battlefield which is just a giant roar as if it's like uh it's as if you know what it is it's as if if the if the person's last moment on this planet they were shouting it's like that shout being heard uh, before the person even reaches that moment.
mortality the reminder of mortality is like an alarm clock that can't be snoozed that's the ultimate motivation you know strangely it's kind of the most selfish motivation is has become selfless where the person It's pretty much you, you use yourself for the greatest potential of the collective self and then It's like using your effort <clears throat> so the future becomes effortless. So that's another way where there could be effortless effort. So guys, Lorna in the chat section says, so Mr. Within, how do I practice forward thoughts? And do you ever perfect it or is it like meditation? Here's the thing, um, this is the reason <clears throat> I'm saying you shouldn't think of anything, you shouldn't even think of meditating, that's the issue, you're thinking there's something called meditation, <laughs> it's like every human being is different, pretty much think of it, you're an antenna and you're going there in a moment sitting still and silent and letting, literally Rumi says this, let the water settle. For me, it's like it's. It was at first. It was about like okay, do it. Do the nice pose and sit there and try to do this technique. Yay! You know, I step A, step step B, step C. Then you realize what is this? It's like horse riding. You. It's like forget any teacher. You got to look at the horse. You got to look at that moment. You know, <clears throat> and when it becomes important to you, why your eyes are open, you will become the guide of your body. You, it's kind of strange. It's like you become an ally of yourself. And it depends. People are different, honestly. 
Because if you want to talk about technique, I have no idea. The best technique is to look in the mirror. <laughs> because you see, if you, if you want to look at your body, you, you go and see the mirror, right? You go look in the mirror. But if you want to look at your mind, there is no mirror for that. Maybe words, language written on a page could somehow mirror the, your mind. Or you just sit still. That's the thing. If you do something, there is endless ad infinitum potential of ideological extraction from the void. But if you are simple, if you go and sit somewhere that's humbling, I'll tell you, you know, <clears throat> go sit, go sit like on the grass. If you're someone who never sits on the grass, don't care about anything. You know, just go and sit on the grass, you know, something that you're not used to wear. Like if you're someone wearing a suit every day, go sit on the grass, go sit on just like some grassland, <laughs> you know, and take off your tie so you don't feel enslaved to something. <laughs> you don't feel chained to something. Okay, Lorna, I'll tell you something easier. <laughs> You're like, I have to wear a suit and sit on concrete. No, okay, sit on your kitchen floor. Somewhere odd. Somewhere that's, <clears throat> I'm saying like, sit somewhere humbling. Sit in the staircase. Sit, sit at the, I don't know, um, edge of your car. I don't know, like sit somewhere you don't normally sit. Somewhere that you don't like sitting. You know, <laughs> so <clears throat> sit there so it, it's like you feel a bit humble. You feel you can be your real self, you know. And let me tell you, this the, the only meditation is called doing nothing. Practice the doing nothing meditation. <laughs> Practice the there is no meditation meditation, you know. <clears throat> because I'm telling you, you're just a being. Whoever you are, you're just energy that's aware of itself. Your energy, attention, based on how attention moves as energy, your identity, your thoughts, everything arises. I'm telling you, first learn from the simple dimensions of how you're being in this life, then learn from what you can do. I think you're, the thing for, for you, Lorna, I would say in the chat section, don't, don't care. You're not, in meditation is not, you, I don't think you should... Focus on forward thoughts or anything like that. Go for walks. I will tell you, go for walks in nature. <clears throat> you want to have forward uh, thoughts, you know, walk forward, you know. <laughs> the point is that we are constantly behaving in front of our world. We're trying to be something in the moment endlessly. If that stops, but you also are comfortable, then you actually get to see the world, you know? <clears throat> when you don't think, when you, when you can be a student of the moment, Oh, the, the, uh, it said, they say, like, when the student is ready, the master appears. <clears throat> when the mind has went through enough turbulence, then the mind cares to pilot itself. Then the mind can. And so, everything can be involuntary, really.
You see, we need space before we can move. So if we are to have something great happen for the species, we have to create the space for it. And that means there is an individual activation and then there is a collective activation. Now the question should be, we as individuals on this planet, how would we like to activate the future generations? That means we are a species that was not just conscious of its body, not just conscious of its mind, but the echo of its soul that is the future of mankind. The future of humanity is the echo of the soul, really. <clears throat> that means I wonder, okay, what is moving right now in the moment? Is it just an object? Is it just a subject? Is it the whole moment attributelessly witnessing itself as if inside the sphere, endless attributes, the sphere itself is attributeless, beyond the attributeless, there's more. You know, it is now the mystic's turn in civilization. Do you know? <clears throat> Little did the shaman know that the world would become sh a shamanic. There's this um, story that is set in a religious context, <clears throat> but it's not a religious story. It's um, this story, there's this woman who she gets a vision, this widow. She's living alone and she gets a vision that there is a God. God comes to her dream and every day she's praying, you know, she's praying and she sleeps and she's like, uh, praying every time she prays she's like God please come and visit me please come and visit my house please come and visit my house and it's this widow who has cleaned her this house you know her house and whatnot and so <clears throat> what happens is in one of her dreams a voice a strangely divine voice says uh, your prayers are answered I'll be coming tomorrow you know something like that now this this woman is like wakes up whoa god said god's visiting me oh my god god is coming right she she makes sure everything in the house is spotless spotless everything is clean then she waits she's waiting the door knocks there is this uh person whose car what do you call it who's the wheel of cars broken he's like ma'am can i use your phone you know and the lady's like, get out of here. God's about to visit me. And the guy's like, what? Ah. You know, the guy gets out of there. <laughs> so what happens is she goes on waiting again and the door knocks. And this time it's this beggar kid. Do you know? This beggar kid who's like needs money or something and the lady's like get out of here you know don't you realize god is coming we don't we i don't we don't need filth on these two on, on the stairway you know and <clears throat> she uh, she banishes the kid aside you know then she goes in waits waits it becomes evening the door rings she's like now this is it you know and then there's this lady who's like this old lit neighbor who's freaked out and needs some help do you know and this lady says, no, no, I can't get out of here, you know, and he tells this old lady to go away. <clears throat> and she's there waiting. She goes home and she's like, God, where well, God was supposed to come here, what is this, you know? She sleeps that night and in her dream, the voice comes. She finds an audience with the divine. And she says, God, why didn't you come? <laughs> I cleaned the house. Everything was perfect. I, I, I did, you know, everything perfectly. Why? Why, God? Why didn't you come? And God says, I came three times to your door. And you pushed me aside. You see, it's not just playing along with the act in a good way and thinking that's living. It's actually noticing, becoming life sensitive to the events taking place.
Excuse me, guys. It's strange, you know? <clears throat> Life in the outer realms is peaceful, but in the inner realms there is the language wars. The symbols. We are possessed by symbology. And it's strange. We don't have a way out in the sense that we have to be individuals in the system, yet our values are collective. All the leaders of nations are chosen because they want freedom and, you know, goodness for the people. Do you know? But what does freedom mean when there is a scarcity on this planet? What does it mean about decency? You see, the issue is, if we had a multidimensional perspective on the human being, imagine instead of money right now, I don't know, apples were the most important thing. Do you know? It could be any other thing. Imagine like self, like think, I'm just saying like it's sometimes when you look at life, you kind of get this feeling. What if these 8 billion human beings could instantly just switch the context they're perceiving the intensity of life in? <clears throat> that means people are trying to change themselves. They don't understand. You don't need to change it yourself, really. Your world is changing all the time. You just need to consciously change with it. There's no, there's no secret to a changing world, you know, it's like, what secret do you want? It's, 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 uh, <laughs> it's like, let me tell you a secret, you know, the only thing that doesn't change is the changeless. So a metaphysics based on image, which is found in the realm of change is not a true metaphysics. This is why I'm saying in my school of thought, uh, it is, uh, um, the soul doesn't have a personality. So I don't know how people feel their like they, they feel their soul has a personality. It doesn't it doesn't make sense to me? You know, I think what they mean the individual Atman, but the individual Atman isn't the true soul. The at the individual Atman is like between the mind and the soul. There is a middle way. So think as if there is <clears throat> there is a space between the body and the mind where the ego lives. And then there's a space between the mind and the soul. And that's where the individual individual soul lives. But when you realize nature has never gone anywhere and it is you who is connecting the dots, the center of the circle laughs at thinking the circumference was only it. You see, it's like before we have truly understood what the human being is, their cultural, you can say, uh, ideological programs are li limiting life. <clears throat> that means you can say there, uh, I mean, in Buddhism, this is how it was acknowledged. Even the word Buddha means the awakened one. In a book uh, I'm writing called Civilization 2.0, Sky Cities, The Heavenized Earth, and Advancement Beyond the Language Threshold, <clears throat> there's a story I share at the beginning where imagine 8 billion human beings were teleported to a, so a ship in the middle of nowhere, and this ship, giant ship, you know, vertical ship where 8 billion, hu a ship where 8 billion human beings are in, and now what's going on in this ship in, uh, that's in unknown waters and the waters is different the way I've said the waters is that the water there is uh, literally the stars and galaxies in the water the water is not blue it's literally like the universe So what happens is one side of this giant ship where 8 billion human beings are in the middle of this unknown, in the middle of unknown waters, one part of the ship is sinking. There's holes in it, right? And there are people who are uh, fixing the, uh, the holes of this ship and the hole has become so big where now the whole species has to play their part accordingly until we, the problem is fixed. And the issue now is... <clears throat> how does the side of the boat that sees the hole tell the other side when the other side doesn't believe there's anything wrong? 
You know, so many people uh, from a religious context, they act like they love the world. But if you really love the world, it would mean to engage it completely, no? You see, the, the issue is, <clears throat> just like how we used to brand cows, like how messed up that was. <laughs> we are branding uh, objective phenomena. We're not, we have named uh, objects, we have named subjects, and we have even named events. And the cool thing now is mysticism is realizing the event is unknown. That means the most instantaneous knowing is unknown. The unknown is knowing the unknown, pretty much. That's what a conscious life means. And guys, anybody who has questions, um, please share them uh, while I'm speaking because I'm going to look at them and then pretty much end the talk. <clears throat> we have to playfully transition from the meaningless into from the past from the old meaning meaningful to the uh from the old meaningless to the new meaningful it's to increase speed and increase uh the multidimensionality of attention really It could be that because our technology is giving us way more access to a lot of information, our inner realms are moving at a, at a faster speed of change than our outer realms. And because the inner realms are moving way faster than the outer realms, we feel there it's meaningless. Do you see what I mean? I could say uh, sometimes in life, um, something that gets close to perfection even though perfection is not something to reach, pretty much the Buddha says, impermanence, in, imperfection, incompleteness, three jewels. Realize this and you'll chill out as a human being. <laughs> yeah. So Lorna, you got to explain what you mean by this forwarded thought. What do you mean by that? So if you explain that in the chat section, it'd be clear.
Ah, okay, Lorna, I think I know what you're saying now. Um, that's the thing. It's a trick question. Oh, yeah, yeah. Um, okay, let's say the person, the social creature... Let's say the child opens its eyes, it's spoon-fed food, and it's spoon-fed an extreme amount of ideology. Literally, that every person who wakes up every day, you're bombarded by different, different animate events taking place. <clears throat> so you can say that the person starts off as like, all right, I have a name, I have a personality, I have a body, I'm in a world, yay, just go with the program. <coughs> Life is the most support, important event we ever get to attend. We can be the personality in an unknown presence, or we can be the known <coughs> person, uh, presence. We can know the presence. When you know yourself as presence, there's nothing to do. It's like I suddenly realized like how these yogis could sit in caves for such long times because there was no self. Who gets tired? <laughs> you know, who can get tired? You know. So, Lorna, I, I, I don't know, like maybe how the other day I said it about... forward thought but I said I have something I remember saying is go forth <clears throat> as being the ultimate command the ultimate instruction and the reason is is pretty much if you don't do anything life will move you if you do something you get a chance to move you and that's the whole point of having this life you know the idea is not to um uh, fall into an ideological script. I was like, well, you know, it's like looking at certain religious ideology and be like, oh my God, I gotta be an actor and memorize these lines and, you know, act as if this is this. And uh, there's a uh, director that I can't say anything about. <laughs> Consciousness is the roar of eons. We are not the first roar and we are not the last roar. But we are like the middle roar, you know. We're literally the middle child of the cosmos, you know. <laughs> the future is our older brother, our past is our younger brother, you know. The younger brother, we're like, okay, you know, you got, you got a bit to learn. The older brother, we're like, what can we learn? <laughs> Just wonder about your attention, guys. Let me tell you a story of enlightenment, an actual story of enlightenment. Do you know? There was a man named Sri Nisargadot Maharaj. This man was a very poor uh, person, cigarette salesman, living this incredibly poor life. And it's as if based on the genetical hand he was dealt, you could see he was not treated well either in this life. And so <clears throat> that means he wasn't, um, his appearance was uncommon. And so what happened is
Shiri Romana Ma, uh, Shirin Sargadat Maharaj, pretty much uh, just to uh, finish the story, guys. Um, he's a poor cigarette salesman. One day, his friend in India, they have this context of being able to realize God in the cultural program. <clears throat> and so, this poor cigarette tobacco salesman. pretty much having nothing. His friend one day says, hey man, there's this enlightened guy, let's go see him. And his friend out of nowhere comes and takes him to this enlightened guy. And they go to this enlightened guy uh, who's just sitting on a mat, <laughs> this yogi in the middle of a market, just sitting on a mat on the ground. This dude just sitting and people just come and sit around him, you know? <clears throat> And uh, the, the guru looks at Sri Nisargadat Maharaj, and he's this humble, very quiet, silent person, you know. And the guru looks at him and says, just this intense look, and he says, uh, study yourself. Every moment you get, study yourself. And that's it. And it's such a strange thing. Do you know, and Sri Nisargadat Maharaj he goes on every day after that, not, not, not seeing the guru, and the guru after two weeks is no longer there. You know, he, the Maha Samadhi is out of here. Shirin Sargadat Maharaj, in every lunch break, before he sleeps, pretty much every moment of his life, he starts asking himself, what is this self? He tries to not even ask, just study it, just to know more about how this mind that we are is, you know, it's like, it's like, it's like, it's like, how can you have an instruction manual, you know, on, <laughs> on something that is <clears throat> the seer? Sight is just being there, you know, as we move in it, we identify as a character of perception. A new ethos needs to arise, a new story for the human being. And so it's as if, when are we going to get tired? of the dual power structure. They say you can't have two tigers on, two, uh, on one mountain. And it is kind of true that you can't have Sometimes freedom and discipline at the same time. But I think it's the most remarkable question. Study yourself. That was an assignment the educational system never gave me. You know. <laughs> Imagine they make a class and there's a person that's like, All right, kids, welcome to consciousness class. <laughs> And the whole class is you just stare at a mirror and ask yourself why. The kids come into the class and give presentations on what they feel consciousness is so far. And that's the whole class, you know. <laughs> just an ability to see again what deserves to be seen in you. It's like the more you hold, the more you will lose. The less you hold, the less you can lose. But it doesn't mean even physically, it also means ideologically. That means if you think, you, if you want a certain expectation out of the outer realms, then the inner realms, it's like, it's like, 
the attention can be if the attention is let's say beyond 50 percent in the inner realms so it's 60 percent in the inner realms or 51 percent in the inner realms and 51 is nothing well let's say like 70 70 percent in the inner realms that means you feel 70 percent more as a mind moving a body and 30% as a body projecting a mind. Now, if the person feels there's 70, if you feel more like a mind, the point of the mind is it's instant and unconditional. I could say the word apple and in your inner realms, you can remember a moment where you saw an apple. So if you feel you're more a mind than a body, you will become dismissive of your body. If you feel you're more body, more your body than your mind, if the percentage was reversed, then it's like, what is the mind? You're too busy being a body. What's well, like, what's the point of, you know, evolving 4 billion years when you got to act like an animal to survive, you know? So the, 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 if the more we build a system that engages, that occupies the human attention more with more uh, tasks of the mind, that means I feel like they should create. They should create like this uh, virtual reality like machine in bars, and in bars where there's street fights or something, the people can go and wear goggles and go into a virtual reality simulation, like cyberspace simulation, and have the street fight in the cyberspace simulation. Do you know? Because the whole point of the fight is to prove something, right? <laughs> You know, sometimes when a person has nothing to prove, it's like, it's like sometimes when you, it's like this, if, if you don't touch um, something sticky, your hand doesn't get sticky, you know? <laughs> Let's say you work in a glue factory. <laughs> that's the worst place to work, honestly. It's like, that's a... <laughs> Anyways, guys, care for the advancement of your civilization, care for the advance, advancement of yourself, and if mankind is victorious and tolerant enough, compassionate enough, then an advanced civilization can be ushered in. So first we got a, a literally, I don't know, a group of architects, of a prototype of a next civilization should happen most likely, you know. <clears throat> when the greater vision of the species activates, the true potential of mankind will be seen. I mean, like, the best argument is, it's like, don't we want to see how advanced our civilization could be, you know? I'm telling you, everything will point to an advanced civilization. Everything. You think about it, it's like anybody can have any belief system, ideological system, but when we're a bunch of creatures on a rock in the middle of nowhere, building an advanced civilization is the way to go. And the evolution of the most advanced civilization is to interstellar cities, pretty much. But before they can become interstellar cities, they go through an evolution of sky cities. So a sky city is a city that is above Earth, but it, is, it can't go beyond the atmosphere. Maybe based on, if it's based on magnetic technology or, I don't know, some other kind of technology. You know, many people don't know this, but there's a man named Buckminster Fuller, and this guy found a way of making 
a sort of portable house that the person can just put on the back of their truck and and uh, go go anywhere. Do you know? Buck Minister Fuller was thinking of that. He was thinking of a portable house. And that's honestly the best house you have. It's like you need to buy a house once, then you can live anywhere. Imagine in the future there's this giant, this giant airplane where people, a bunch of people, a bunch of houses fly into there like a parking lot. And this giant airplane takes all these houses to like another part of the world or something. We would call them uh, Sky House Buses. <laughs> and I don't know, guys, why I chose this wallpaper, really. There was something about being able to walk alone that renders you completely comfortable walking anywhere in the cosmos. So once the person can accept their simplicity and don't fear being in simpler states of mind and not fearing being in complex states of mind, then you are an advanced communicator. Then for the first time, the karma of the world steps back because the conscious doer is there. You know, you see, you can say that the ego is an iron man suit. So the, the, th the thought of yourself right now in your inner realms, how you feel like you're a subject hearing me. Like if I ask you who's hearing me right now, you know, you say me, you know, whatever your name is. So, so you see that name, that name is hovering in thin air behind your eyes. Have you noticed? Have you not noticed? That's the fascinating thing. The bodies are not doing anything. We can't, you can't be an object. Because the object by definition can't be a subject. <laughs> Do you see what I mean? Western civilization has to look at what it's defining as an object, what it's defining as a subject, and may realize that language is the most important uh, field of academia. I will tell you, it's, let me tell you what it is. It's literally like if all the branches of academia, you know, of the academic system, they were knights, they are all coming in front of language, you know, the, <laughs> the, uh, the, um, uh, the field of language, you know, where the throne of uh, conceptual thought is kept. We are stories that feel pain. I mean, it's mind-blowing. We're characters in subjective story. We're subjective character in a subjective story. It's as if like our, when consciousness is a paint upon the world that rebrands the world as a uh, uh, subtler phenomenon. So the greater vision of the species activates by the person if you want something different then what everybody else is doing, you have to do something different. Do you see what I mean? That means if you want a different outcome, real, a common sense way, you got to do something different. And it's the same. It's, the, it's, it's an instant of transition. Sometimes I feel in my life, I'm just panning into another dimension of thought. You know, just panning again into another dimension of thought. You know, <laughs> so let us remind the cosmos why we are here and why it is here. That the human species now cared for not just how the physical appearance, how the physical civilization looked like, but cared about the uh, beauty of the mind of civilization, the overall outcome. Uh, uh, of every individual behavior on this planet. We have to start treating the planet as uh, like an airport. And endless characters, it's like, it's like history is a giant script, endless characters being born having their own storylines. 
history is like a, it's like a giant tree story. Do you know what I mean? <laughs> it's a giant story that's like a tree endlessly branching out as long as the human species continues. If you are a human being, serve the realm of humanity, you know, and wonder about the unknown. It is why knowledge is still alive, why knowledge still has something to do. <laughs> knowledge has as much purpose because if we knew everything, why would we want to know anymore? That's the thing sometimes. You got to think about it. If you were someone who was great right now, would you be thinking about your weakness? It's a choice and it's an inner choice of where your attention like a bird flies down on. What concept, con the, it's like the last concept, you know, uh, the, the attention... Uh, found itself on. Study your outer realm, study your inner realms, share the novelty with the civilization and I don't know, hopefully something uh, remarkable happens, you know. Because it's getting too boring, you know, it's like so much, so much repetition of the same chaotic and ordered, like so much the patterns in history are repeating. It's like after a while, we're like, what are we doing here? You know, <laughs> so it's that's the thing. It's we have to usher in uh, the advanced communicators. We have to realize we're advanced communications of nature. And it's like a four billion year old uh, uh, lottery ticket you just won that you are experiencing yourself as the most conscious species on this planet. And there is something different. I mean, no, no other, like if we were to define uh, the potential of animals based on the general uh, uh, ability of animals on this planet of all the different species we are the species that did the unthinkable that just did just that which was even like do you know what I mean because for me I was like there's been always so many species why only this one species got caught in the wave of evolution managed to be this evolved you know that means there was an interference with nature uh, my personal opinion is, uh, if you look at the biological body, it's like something stopped the evolution of this creature and it stood on its legs. I feel a, a potential non-human agency uh, beyond shape, uh, but... Uh, there was an intervention with the evolutionary animal. Something doesn't fit, doesn't make sense, you know? It's like it's too easy to just think it's, it's, it, there is no, uh, beyond the atmosphere epigenetical influence. Leonardo da Vinci says simplicity is the most ultimate sophistication. That means the complexity that is not aware of the simplicity is, is just devoid of its own origin.
you think says mr within how did people get so cynical instead of cyclical let me tell you when we don't realize it's a cycle we feel we can judge you see it's like a part of life is like an event that's happening and a part of it is an interpretation of the event that is happening. Now, what's going on in identity and people's meaning is all about the interpretation of what's actually happening. Do you know? That means, imagine you see um, the open sign to a store and your friend doesn't. Your friend uh, looks uh, doesn't, and uh, um, but you see the open sign. Now your friend says, man, I'm, I'm sure that store isn't open. And you're like, listen, man, it's open. You see, there's the sign. And the person's like, that sign doesn't mean anything, you know. <laughs> and uh, so what happens is then the person goes and opens the door. And once the door of the store is opened, the person realizes the store was open. And it's simply like that. Experiential design before ideological perspective. Lorna says, Lorna says, so back to that thinking thing. <laughs> After it gets attention, what do you do? And how to move from thought to thought. Um, so Lorna, you might have missed something. I'm saying you're not a thought. That's my whole thing. Here, I'm telling you, you're not a thought. What does that mean? That means the thoughts come and go. That means you, 10 years ago, had a different sense of your own self. Do you know? You now have a different sense of your own self. The thoughts are moving already. You know, there's this lecture from Sadhguru. He says the content of your mind is not your choice. What that means is a lot of things that happen to us, they're just events that are happening. If you don't identify with it, it just passes. You know, imagine you're a person walking and somebody comes and says something uh, negative and you're just staring at them and they say something negative, they're staring at you and imagine you just continue walking. You know, sometimes you, you, it's like if you honor your attention, you go where you need to be, you know. So, so Lorna, what I'm telling you is don't try. It's easier than that. It's instant. What does that mean? Can you, it, if something is instant, do you have to do anything? The moment you do something, that's two moments. That's two instants. <laughs> you know? It's to realize your attention is the president of your mind. Attention is something that everybody has a different DNA. Nobody knows uh, how your eyes are. You see, that's the thing. We have different inner realms and outer realms, you see. So Lorna, I would tell you, you have a different inner realm. I have a different inner realm. But me and, uh, me and you in this live stream, in the chat, we're communicating in the outer realms. You see, we are in the same outer realms. Now you are asking me, how do I perceive my inner realms from the outer realms? It's, it was never in the outer realms. It's not an outer thing you do. It's just you stop doing anything and you notice how you're being and you're patient and it's as if you, there's nothing to get. Let me tell you a story, a mystical Sufi story, before I end off from Hafez, where Hafez in one of his poetry, one of his poems, he writes, uh, in the book, The Gift, he writes uh, He writes that he goes to this uh, way more uh, uh, wise and, you know, liberated than him, this man named Attar, this great poet, which I've read his quotes in these talks. So Hafez goes to Attar and wants to be Attar's disciple. And Attar looks at Hafez and Hafez says to Attar, I want to be your disciple. And Attar looks at him and says, you're not ready, go. And Hafez gets so offended by this that he goes into the desert 
back in the day, this story is from 700 years ago. Back in the day, he goes into the desert, draws this circle, sits in that circle, and decides not to leave it until all his desires have left. After 40 days, an angel, Hafez, has become so desireless. He has no desire. He wants nothing. For 40 days, he sat on the same spot in nature. He has no desires. And on the 40th day, an angel comes to him and says, Hafez, the divine paradise, the heavens will give you anything you ask for. What do you desire? And Hafez remains quiet. Even the gods came to, to give him a desire. Even his divine desire got tamed. He gets up from the circle and he has no desires. Not that he can't have desires, he doesn't desire his desires, but he can desire them anytime. And he goes, and Attar sees him, and sees Hafez, just one look at his face, and sees how simple, how simple and uh, natural, sincere he's become. And then Attar says, all right, you're a disciple now. Pretty much all of this is written in Hafez's poetic writings, of course, in, in his own way. No, no, no. The point of it is that it's like uh, you're, you are, it's you're, you're trying to, uh, you're trying to find the truth of the other side of the coin, but the coin is always flipping. The ultimate meditation is to wonder about. Who's looking in your eyes, through your eyes? Who are you? And if the person realizes they don't know and they can be honest, that is how it begins. That's when you start noticing mystical butterflies. Divine butterflies in, in the inner realms. I feel that um, when you realize no one has your eyes, you become the pilot. Anyways, guys, take care. I hope this episode was helpful. And um, all that can be said is rise, mankind. Right.